Hi everyone, this is Sandra again with the Discovery Lab series, welcome. Today we have a special guest and her name is uh, Helen Schwenke. Helen is an ecologist who devotes her life to invertebrates and she's especially interested in the larval forms of insects and other invertebrates, but especially butterflies from what I know. And Helen has played an integral part in creating Wood Fortier's invertebrate habitat. At, you know, we've planted over 100,000 plants and Helen has been really engaged in really getting us to think about how to plant for invertebrates. And we have a thing called the butterfly walk. You might have seen this before. If not, I'll check it out. <laughs> but without further ado, here is Helen Schwenke. Welcome, Helen. Thank you so much for being on the show. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Lovely to be here. Thank you. Helen. And acknowledging the traditional owners of the land just because I like doing that. That's wonderful. Yes, go on. Yes, I'm just wondering about your uh, your background. How did you come to, you know, love creatures, the small creatures, and to know so much about them and to how did you come about to get to this place where you are now, but also what is your history with that? That's actually something I've only recently recovered. Um, but um, I always thought the start, story started in around 1983 when my then partner and I discovered that butterflies, caterpillars were host plant specific, which means most small creatures only eat one or a small range of plants. And I, I had an interest in nature and I thought, I've always thought that that was the starting place. But recently I was doing a, um, a video challenge on how to do videoing uh, for social media and I was asked uh, well, one of the little exercises was to do a two minute short video on um, um, an early childhood memory and I didn't think I had any so I was thinking oh my god I'm not even going to be able to do this challenge if they're all going to be like that and then about like some time later like I I remembered this really strong feeling of being a very tiny child, I must have only just been starting to walk, and and I, the only place I could have been in is is in a playpen at Indrapilly where my parents were building a house on land that had been cattle country, so it was cleared, but it was prior to improved pastures. And even as I speak it, I still get goosebumps of the sheer joy and delight of seeing little creatures flying off in all directions as I run through this little tiny area as only a small child can be running through an area so and I was really and I realized that nearly every one of my actions since then in terms of nature and nature conservation has been about trying to recapture that really early childhood experience and a whole lot of the stuff I've done like was setting up or helping set up the butterfly walk and another project I was doing for a while which was a monthly walk called walking with life going back to bushland settings was actually a search for that that intense feeling of joy at so yeah so it goes back to being a very very tiny child stuck in a playpen but um but it's been really lovely to recover that memory because it's it's really informing what i'm doing now with much more depth so i'm um, yeah i'm very pleased with having done that particular little video challenge on how to do videos. <laughs> um, so that, and like, and so I had two good teachers at school, two good biology teachers who were really into their subject and I already was clearly interested in biology, but, um, but not realizing where it had come from. And, um, and they put me on a good path with engaging my passion in biology because ecology was barely a, dis, um, a word that was used back then. And then I went on to do a degree in what was applied biology, but was really ecology, but I don't think there was a single ecology degree, at least not in Brisbane at the time, in the, in the 1970s. So, um, and from there I just, yeah, kept being interested, started, found out that, well, butterflies were host plant specific and then started with my then partner um, planting butterfly host plants, seeing butterflies lay eggs, raise caterpillars and started writing some books. Um, the first of which was a little book called Butterfly Magic, which sold 
somewhere around the 2,000 copies in 1994. Um, and helped set up the Butterfly and Other Invertebrates Club, or at least we used it to set up the Butterfly and Other Invertebrates Club. And that covered 12 plants for um, a range of butterflies at that time. The information just wasn't in on sort of the complexity of this stuff, at least not at a community level. And I had wasn't applying my degree to any of this because it was just fun and a hobby. Um, so in the background, I was a librarian and um, subsequently an adult educator, but not necessarily in this field. Um, but I got involved with, the, well, I actually was the founding president of the Butterfly and Other Invertebrates Club and remained there for 12 years and um, got invited to get involved with Woodford in 2003 and yeah, built the butterfly department and built... Um, the monthly working bees and the butterfly department became uh, rather elaborate. Starting with just two of us, it became something like 17 volunteers on the books, 12 of whom were um, wearing uh, costumes representing real butterflies and was a community education project during the festival. Um, and for that, uh, for the absolutely exquisite costumes, I would really want to acknowledge Gail Dawson, initially Kerry Howe, but then Gail Dawson and um, and along the way James Fish were good costume makers and but Gail just turned them into exquisite um, things of beauty with her silk painting. So, um, but anyway, so the costumes are still doing the rounds at Woodford, as I um, as I understand it. So, um, yeah. So I hope that answers how I got started. Um, mm. I just need a bit of water. No, it's, it sounds like a great um, story and it's always awesome to reconnect to those childhood memories and know where your, where your interest comes from. And I would just like to yeah, know no, more about your, uh, your own personal experiences with raising caterpillars because it has led you in the end to write a book because I think most of us don't understand this really specific nature of the fact that some butterflies only have specific host plants that their caterpillars can actually feed from. So I'd like you to speak a little bit about okay. that. Um, the book is called Create More Butterflies and I've recently re-released it um, with a new cover and um, I've updated some um, images inside and it's available through my website, um, Earthling Enterprises. Um, and yes, so... It arose from the original book called Butterfly Magic, which is now out of print. Um, and then that was produced in 1992 and just gained more and more experience with growing host plants, um, finding the butterflies, laying eggs on them, um, bringing the eggs and or small caterpillars inside and raising them and photographing their life cycles and then turning them into signs, which um, are on display at Woodford. So I've got 60 signs for different plants. But anyway, that's another story. Sorry. Um, and um, in 2005, so two years into being involved with Woodford, um, I produced with um, Frank Jordan, Create More Butterflies. And um, so it's been in print since. It's, um, it's sold something like 5,000 copies now. Uh, so it's pretty good going. Um, and it, yeah, it... So altogether, I, the last count I did, I've raised 75 different species of butterfly caterpillars and photographed their life cycles. And, and a number, I mean, I've done a lot of other creatures, but I haven't systematically um, set about recording them as much as I was butterflies. But uh, the butterfly story was a way of using creatures that people could like um, to engage to engage them with nature and with growing plants for creatures. So uh, I, to tell the rest of that story, 98 to 99% of the animal species on the planet are creatures that don't have backbones. So they can't stand up for themselves and we need to do it for them. Um, so, but if you go to the species that have been named, so are known to science have been described, 92% of all the described animal species on the planet are invertebrates. So I'm sticking with the 92%, knowing full well that it's actually 98 to 99%, but you have to go with numbers that are actually 
documented because we literally do not know how many invertebrates there are on the planet. We, near, we probably know almost all of the vertebrates. So vertebrates are the things that uh, everybody can name fairly quickly, fish, frogs, um, birds, mammals. Um, I think I've covered them. Um, and, and they get all our attention. And then the bulk of animal species on the planet are, um, are actually invertebrates. And I haven't got the numbers up at the moment, and I'm lousy at remembering numbers. But let me um, have a quick look. Um, some ridiculous number of... Um, so if we're looking at named species, 8% are, inver are vertebrates. So of the 92% of uh, animals that are invertebrates, 65% um, of, of all animals, sorry, 65% of all animals are insects. We're talking only about the named ones. 34% of all the named animals on the planet are insects that eat plants. And we've spent all our time concentrating on 0.34% or less probably of all the named animals on the planet that cause us any sort of problems that we consider pests. And that's crop pests. So the, I'm just trying to elaborate on how little we know about the subject area I'm passionate about, which is we know, we know precious little. We do know that a very large percentage of that 34% of animals that eat plants eat only one or a very small range of plants. So all, all animal species range somewhere on a spectrum from being generalists, and we're a prime example of a generalist. Us rats and cockroaches is my black sense of humour. Um, and um, then you get some creatures that are so highly specific that they'll only eat one plant or they'll only be pollinated by, sorry, the plant will only be pollinated by one insect, or the, the, the plant itself will, the insect will only eat one plant. But, and when you start thinking about all those millions and millions of creatures and the goodly portion of them that are host-specific, um, you start, I, that started giving me a very concrete understanding of how complex this all is. And butterfly host plants have been good because they're easy. It's easy to see the adults lay eggs. You can collect them. You can become familiar with them. I have a 33-year-old butterfly host plant garden. Um, of the 75 species of animals that I know I've raised and documented, um, uh, 50 of them were raised off my West End block, which is only 405 squares, square metres. So it's a very small area. So it basically proves the point that we can make a really big difference in terms of biodiversity if more of us are doing it, um, if we plant local native plants in our local places and spaces. Um, and that's become the core message. Core messages are the only good leaf is a chewed leaf because at least something's eaten it that's then gone on to feed the rest of the food web. And, um, and we need to be doing local native plants in our local spaces and places and the reason for that is that everything that's evolved on the planet has a role to play there is no such thing as a useless thing in nature and we tend to not keep that in take but we don't take it into account and everything that has evolved has evolved in a place in a community of other life forms be they plants and animals and the inter and all those interactions are just beyond our comprehension but amazing just absolutely amazing and 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 nothing is expendable but we keep treating a whole lot of things as though they are so i'm probably a little off your question but it's just yeah it's just becoming more and more important for a whole host of all sorts of whole host of reasons to start thinking about well what actually evolved in this local place and also those, those evolution relationships are ongoing, except that we keep simplifying ecosystems and making it harder and harder for those processes to happen. So, um, yeah, so does that, I've, I've ranged a bit. Does that answer your question?
Yes, that's a very good answer. I just feel like it's very encompassing of everything that's happening. And we are noticing more and more loss of biodiversity in general. But I would assume that there are a lot of these creatures, the small, unseen or uncared for biodiversity of invertebrates that we, we, ha well, we haven't discovered them all. So we don't know what we're losing. We don't know what's really out there. And one of the best ways to do it is, as you say, go out into your backyard and plant for them and see what comes, you know. And I just think that is such a fabulous message for future generations, for us now, that wow. in the world of loss, we can actually create through this process that you have outlined in your book and in the book that you're going to tell us about, a new book. So I would love to know more. How could we encourage people? How could we, what are the steps that people can take in their own backyard right now to really embrace and, and give to these creatures that are suffering right now in this world? Um, uh, well, we're, we're actually starting to talk about the, the new book um, with that. Um, so the new book is about ecological complexity and how it relates to gardening, but also to a certain extent how to integrate local native plants with, um, with food gardens. Because nearly all the information that comes through permaculture and nearly every other source is things like, I hate to say it, good bug mix. But they're all introduced plants from somewhere else that didn't evolve in our local places and spaces. And while we might see the creatures that use them because they will be attracting passing um, insects that are getting a bit of nectar or pollen, they are not actually habitat plants in any really fixed or firm sense of the word in that they're not the larval food plants or the, the nymph food plants for all manner of creatures. We, we keep getting tricked by what we see rather than asking well, what else is there that we're not seeing. And this is, this is the biggest problem. Well, I mean, that's how we've evolved. We had to see predators, so we saw big stuff, um, and we didn't pay attention to little things that couldn't harm us. Um, but, yeah, so I'm a little bit off track. So um, in that book, we've actually got a whole section on ecological gardening strategies, um, and I'm in the process of laying it out right now, and it, uh, it covers a wide range of um, things like leave logs where they are, that sort of thing, leave litter fall, don't keep shifting things around. Minimise your soil disturbance. Just with regard to minimising soil disturbance, which is much harder to do these days, 70% um, uh, of the world's native bees are thought to be ground dwellers. So every time, and that's Australian native, uh, Australian native bees, so there's something between 1,500 and 3,000, 2,000 to 3,000 believed to be Australian native bees, and 70% of them are going to be ground dwellers in some shape or form. And the rest are sort of using hollows in logs or, you know, drill holes, borer holes in things. So the more, the more that gets cleaned up, the less, the more simplifying um, gets done. Um, so every time, and most areas are now highly disturbed in urban areas, but every time we disturb the ground, we're we're removing a huge amount of soil fauna and with it potentially any ground nesting bees that we happen, by way of example. I don't like particularly singling out any particular group because they're all, in my understanding, they're all equally important, but it's useful to pick iconic flagship type species that uh, people can relate to. So, um, yeah, so uh, minimum soil disturbance um, is is like one of the strategies, finding out what your local ecosystem type was. Now, a big loss that I'm not, well, shall we say I am speculating or hypothesizing, but I haven't got any way to do the research, that a lot of this, the losses, aside from climate change, which is too hard to address individually other than by the actions you might already be taking, in terms of the actions we can take here and now, um, a lot of the species loss is in the ground covers. If, if you go to any native bushland anywhere near the city, you see massive numbers of garden escapees taking over the ground cover layer 
and in lots of cases blanketing it and if you ever and so this is where my childhood memory comes in because there were no invasives at that ground cover level or not much there might have been a little bit by then but not much um, yeah so the ground covers are being obliterated in in habitat and in our gardens by grass and a whole lot of other things so we keep having this tendency to create monocultures wherever we go and ecosystems are never about a lot of things in one place so so the the most common question is how do i stop such and such eating this is this plant and almost invariably if you look at the situation ecologically people have got a hedge of syzygiums and they're completely separated from any bit of the ecosystem and what you're putting up is this welcome huge flag saying welcome come and eat me because you've actually separated them from their local environment and any i call them fifo insects or fifo butterflies decisions aren't eaten by butterfly caterpillars but any fly and fly out insect can find those plants if they're in the area of course and fairly quickly build up populations and so you get defoliation happening but it's it's nearly always our own actions that are creating the problems and we nearly always assume that it's the creature that's eating the plant so we need to start thinking about what action am i taking to make this infestation possible mm. and it's it's always something we've done like create a monoculture but anyway so the, the book covers uh, some sort of information about ecological um, principles and um, sorry so the new book is called inviting nature to dinner and the benefits of biodiversity in backyards um, and so the premise of the book is that if you're trying to grow vegetables and you want to do much less intervention um, then if you interplant with local natives that are appropriate to that particular what would have been the ecosystem type um, or at least nearby related ones given how ecosystems are changing all the time um, you can increase the biodiversity and that will bring in all sorts of other creatures um, that are predators that have the potential to start using any creatures you've got eating your plants that you, you don't want to share with so much but we also need to start thinking that we need to share our food um, and we need to share it much more and we stop we need to stop this is old stuff we need to stop thinking that things should be in pristine condition when we buy them or grow them but and that's going to take a that's going to take a bit of a turnaround um, for myself i'm trying to sell the joy and magnificence and delight of sharing your space with a whole range of other creatures because you start seeing the complexity that can arise because you've done it so by having native mulberries um, for a few years in the 2000s before a big drought hit um, i had a crested hawk that came into the garden for four to seven days for about two or three years i remember seeing it i didn't document it but and um it would dive it was spending all its time in a very dense um uh, native mulberry and they recorded as eating a range of things but i'm pretty sure it was going for the giant hedge grasshoppers that that particular plant supports quite happily um so that was just like wow my efforts in a small tiny tiny garden uh, are having these flow-on effects and there's been many many more but it was pretty special having a crested hawk so um yeah so a lot of it of parts of the new book will be about uh helping people understand how food webs work and why it's important to diversify your food web for invertebrates but also we've and i grew up on it as well all the information about food webs has nearly always been about vertebrate relationships in food webs and even the best of them have got just a tiny number of insects and so all of our education it's not our fault all of our education has been geared to 
big things that we can see rather than understanding how it all actually works. Did that answer your question? Because um, Yes. I think there are three points that are just so awesome in what you said. Uh, one of them is the monoculture, the moving away from monoculture and allowing nature to do its thing and becoming nature and being nature and allowing her to do this. And trusting, I think trusting the nature to that it knows better than I do because oftentimes we want to control because we want to go, how do we control this organism? Whereas you stated clearly, we have to recognise that we're creating the issues in the first place. And that goes down all the way from the soil level and the soil food web that is so little known, probably even more so than the above ground invertebrate situation because we're look, looking at microscopic creatures. The other thing is that you said was sharing food with other creatures and the joy it brings when, when you have created an, an environment where animals can come in and seeing that food web for yourself, really, I think, as you say, it's not only joyous, but also educational to the point of like, wow, you can understand then what's happening. And, you know, while we definitely need books to do this because we're so uneducated, as you say, or educated in the sort of a minimal, minimalistic way of looking at things because it's such a broad concept, you know, ecology, I think, yes, having your own experiences through, I think through your book, Create More Butterflies, it becomes quite apparent that first, you know, it's like a step. You've got like, if you've got these individual plants, you've got the, this is the, this mm. is what you're going to raise. And then you've got this next step of this book saying, but hang on, there's a whole food web going on that you can interact with and create for that food web. And I just really can't wait for this book to come out. And um yeah, what a wonderful way of looking at things and teaching children to look, look at things in this way, that we're part of the system, that we're not the bad guy, we're not the controller, you know, we're not the CEO. <laughs> we are part of the system and the system brings us joy and, and food and it increases biodiversity and therefore health for the entire planet. Tell us a little bit more about, I'm really interested in this, your own garden that you've created for all the different caterpillars that you have raised, how, like, what is the process? If someone was interested in doing this, because I think a lot of children would be, for example, a lot of schools might be interested, what is the step-by-step -step process? And how do you then extend that into this full soil food web, gar uh, sorry, uh, food web garden? Um, well, my garden isn't actually an example of that because it's actually a... It's the evolution that's led me to my understanding now. But if I was starting now, I would go look at the resources that tell you what the local ecosystem was. And um, some of them are outlined, but I haven't got them top of mind uh, in the book. Um, there's um, the Queensland government has a Queensland globe and there's various other places where you can actually see what the ecosystem was or, and you can get plant lists for those areas. Um, but usually they're the um, the canopy and a bit of understory. They, I have yet to see many plant lists that actually concentrate on the ground covers. And in gardens, there's much more room for doing more ground cover things. So there's, there's still a gap in the information. But that doesn't mean you have to not do it. You can do lots and acknowledge that there's a big gap. So find out what the local ecosystem is. Um, go with... A list of plants so having found out what ecosystem you were in and if your soil hasn't been highly modified since because that then changes the parameters um, uh, you can look for um, reserve areas nearby that have this so there's other lists online um, that give you the plant lists for and the well, the species lists for different um, reserves so you can use those lists to figure out what could have been there and then go to one of the local uh, native nurseries, the catchment group nurseries, um, there's other native nurseries, um, and start acquiring those plants. And, uh, so, see, my garden started with, okay, um, I was into subtropical fruit trees at the time, um, exotics, because I wasn't on this particular path at all. Well, I was just starting on this path, I guess. Um, and so we planted some tropical exotic fruit trees that didn't do very well. Um, and then we started planting any plant that was a host plant for any butterfly that we knew about. So, so there's still a few of those plants sort of, there's the odd 
tropical exotic fruit tree in the garden and there's the odd introduced plant that was a host plant for a butterfly. And then bit by bit, um, as the ecological principles that I learned in an abstract way in my university degree started matching and melding with my hands-on uh, experience, I started seeing what my basic degree was all about. Um, and so from there, I've started realising how important it is to go back to matching what the original ecosystems or ecosystems that would be evolving in these spaces, what their host, what their plant compositions were, because they're going to be the plants that are best adapted. So there's a bit of an issue around um, native plants because I. Often, if you go to just any nursery, you can buy a cultivar that's been a native plant. But the, the interactions between plants and animals are incredibly complex and intense. So by way of example, if, if you have got a caterpillar on a native host plant or any other, but mostly I'll only now talk about natives. So you've got a local native host plant and you've got some caterpillars um, eating it that, are on, that it's the host for. One of the things that, at least for those plants that have been studied, um, have shown is that that helps the, pl that the plant then starts doing a whole lot of chemical things. And one of them is it sends out alarm chemicals that alert some of its sibling plants or parent plants in the nearby, nearby area, and they start producing more defense chemicals. It alerts the predators of the caterpillars that are eating your plants to come and um, start utilising your caterpillars um, for their food source, but it also alerts the predators and parasitoids of the predators and parasitoids of your caterpillar. So you start getting this really complex interaction. So this whole idea about local natives is because those plants have been interacting with those insects for millennia longer than we've been a species on Earth, at least. I mean, there's always shifts in this, but in general. Um, so the interactions, so if you try and bring in a plant from somewhere else, it's likely to have somewhat different phytochemical composition. And this is only one area. Um, there's probably all sorts of other mechanisms. This is one that sort of, um, yeah, a bit of a given. Um, so... I think I've lost track of your question, but uh, the, so no, that's right. The question was about how to get started. So one way to get started on my website, I've got a um, Earthling Enterprises. I've got a list of top 10 plants for 32 butterflies. Um, and if you want to start from that position, if you don't want to start from the ecosystem position downwards, because that is a much more complex way to get going, and it's probably more relevant to bigger spaces. But in, for a home garden, if you want to start with what, a few of the top 10 plants that would have actually grown in your particular area, then that's it's a starting point for then building your knowledge base and getting your more familiarity and starting to see these processes. Um, so that list is for um, southeast Queensland and northern New South Wales, which is a major bioregion um, of Australia called the McLean McPherson Overlap. Um, and many of the plants occur in a decent portion of the range. So you can take that list to your local um, catchment or native plant nursery and, and try and get hold of them. Um, so, yeah, so there's so many different approaches. There's, um, that's the suck it and see approach, I guess. See if you like it. Um, yeah, sorry, I just need some water. That's okay. <laughs> No, this is good. This is gold stuff. Gold so stuff. You, no. you can you can you can start with the most complex and integrated approach, which is what I was describing first, or go out and buy some local native plants, or go out and buy some butterfly host plants and start with that. Um, when you're starting with host plants, you've got to, especially any of those top ten, you've got to fair degree of certainty that something's going to come and eat it within a reasonably reasonable amount of time because they're they're reliable host plants because 
there's like all sorts of complexities in this. So you, you, you get some butterflies that will eat a, have, when I say butterfly, I'm talking about butterfly caterpillars. Butterflies can use nectar, the adults can use nectar from a, usually a wide variety of sources. In fact, there's no butterfly that I've been able to find that is specific about its nectar source or its pollen source. But that doesn't mean there isn't, but I just haven't found one. Um, so for me, the butterfly is the whole animal. And so in my, in my mind's eye, I've, I've raised so many of them. Having raised 75 species doesn't tell you how many actual individual I've, I've raised. I'd have to have raised thousands of individuals because I've done like hundreds of a few different species and tens of them in other cases and twenties. Uh, and so I've, I've probably done a few thousand. I've just never counted um, actual individual caterpillars. Um, so um, I started saying that because, yeah, so on a lot of lists you'll get um, that a particular plant will attract a particular butterfly, but that doesn't mean that it's actually reliable for that particular butterfly. So the, the approach you take in a garden is very much dependent on what outcome you personally want for that garden. So if you do want a show of butterflies, which not at the moment because it's cooled down and the massive population explosion of vast numbers of creatures has passed, but I can look out my kitchen window and as soon as the sun's out, I'll invariably see at least a few butterflies flying around. It's just they're there they're keeping in some sort of the little ones, the little blues are in some sort of tick over population. Um, it's rare that I'll go outside unless it's overcast and not see anything. Um, but, you know, every now and then I, that happens. Um, so, so, so really that's the way I started. But I wouldn't necessarily say that that's the best way to go having accumulated the knowledge I have. Hmm. Is that? Yeah. So Does that answer your question? Definitely. And I want to know, so you grow the plant and then to raise the caterpillars, you raise them for what reason and how do you do it? How do you go about it? What are the steps of raising a caterpillar to a butterfly stage and why would you do it? Why did you do it? I started doing it to for the, um, oh, out of interest, it just appealed to me. So having done Butterfly Magic in 1992, by then I'd, ra I'd raised quite a few species but just in small numbers. Um, I don't know, you, you do it, it's just something you, I have no logical reason other than I wanted to, I wanted to watch the process. So, but how you do it is a bit dependent on what species you're doing, because some species I killed rather a large number of um, before I realised what their, what their requirements were. But there's a whole lot that are very easy to do. I just, I even just do them in, like take away those oblong takeaway containers. Um, uh, you just find the eggs or find young caterpillars. You set up the takeaway containers um, so that you can either fan them regularly. I don't even like put holes in them or anything. Um, I just open the containers often and fan them. Or I set them on their side and allow a little bit of air. Let let all the gases, the exhaust gases from the plant and the creature just drop out because they're usually heavier than air uh, or a little bit carbon dioxide is. Um, and so I clean out the containers. I, mostly now I just put a bit of light, a white tissue in the bottom of the box and spray it lightly to keep, to keep mostly to keep the food as fresh as possible. You need the source of food so you can bring in cuttings. Again, you don't. You never do this for a butterfly called the tailed emperor because all you'll do is kill them. But that was one of the first ones I did because that was 1986 and um, I think it was about the second or third butterfly I'd raised and there were a lot, they had a population explosion and they were on a celtus, horrible celtus tree in the neighbour's yard and I could just do them but I kept just killing them because I didn't know the requirements. So, yeah, I mean, I'm telling a terrible story about myself, and but, you know, there wasn't a lot of information out there yet. And 
one of the forthcoming books will be how to do this because I'm getting the question really often now. Um, but yeah, so um, the main things you need to do is make sure you don't have your containers are cleaned out a lot. Um, that you um, try and prevent predators or parasitoids getting in um, and diseases. Diseases are a big problem. Um, uh, you, you can watch the caterpillar grow. You can see it shed its skin if you're watching at the right time. You start to learn to see when it's going to shed its skin. And mind you, I have sat there with a camera for two to four hours waiting for creatures handheld waiting for a creature that was really nearly ready to shed its skin or nearly ready to emerge as a butterfly just sitting there waiting for it to come out so um, um, the main reason for doing it became the book create more butterflies um, because that's that was the first book in Australia that illustrated whole life cycles um, and that was in 2005 uh, and also, I guess I started really wanting to get the message out that it was about the whole animal. It wasn't just the adult form. And the other thing is caterpillars sit still and you can watch them. Mm. Butterflies are a real pain. <laughs> so the other reason for doing actually one of the main reasons for doing it was uh, because I did want to get pictures of the butterfly. The best way to get them is after they've recently emerged as butterflies from caterpillars you've raised and kept in a container and you've seen them. They sit still while after they've pumped up their wings um, and are still waiting for them to harden, they sit still. So you usually get a really good photo of them if you don't scare them. If you scare them, you kill them or you break the, their wings break easily. But um, So it becomes much easier to photograph the life cycle and at some point they sit there and they open and close their wings as they're testing their flight muscles and so it does take a few hours but I now have uh, along the butterfly walk and in a few other and around the toilet blocks there at Woodfordia there are usually some sort of sign that shows a butterfly life cycle for a plant um, I have um, signs for 60 plants and 40 different butterfly species and there's a whole lot more I could make at the drop of a hat if I if I needed to um, but I'm still looking for people to buy the signs because it needs to, I need to um, I need to pay for to get rid of mortgage on my 33 year old butterfly garden so I'm getting quite it's getting quite critical that I liberate must liberate that mortgage so I can actually keep using the garden to educate people um, about butterflies and their host plants and then the ecological flow on effects. So, um, so yeah, so the, the, the purpose was to take photos of them so I could put them in books and, and then they became, many of them were used for that um, sign series that is around Woodford that I originally developed for Woodford. But they're, they're basically life cycle and they're actually signs about plant so they're made to look like they're signs about the butterfly. Um, because where I can, I include other animals that use that plant that people would be able to see. The vast bulk of all that life forms that are invertebrates and of those that are insects are like little tiny pinpricks of life. So there's many of them are very small and you can't actually you can't actually notice them. And we're not growing the food for them in the suburbs. But anyway, so did, did that answer the question? Yeah, oh, no. definitely. definitely it has. It's a really, um, I just love that you're so childlike and you just go and decided one day, I'm going to go and see this whole life cycle by, you know, just observing it and looking at it. And, and I think that's, that's the whole great discovery that's out there for us, for every child, every human being to have a look at what nature is doing, what it looks um, like how it behaves and exactly you, you just get a completely visceral understanding of it my, I see my role in life as being the resourcer of adults to resource children because I was a seriously under-resourced child so and children need adults in their lives that can do that resourcing for them and I only got to be able to resource myself for that child in me 
in the last like 20 to 30 years so because mm. the resources just went there. so um but yeah so so i'm writing books and i'm planning on doing developing some online courses as well mm, that sounds great what about is there a possibility um, have you ever thought about doing uh like opening your garden as an educational i do yeah yeah Yeah. it's it's, um it's advertised on airbnb experiences cool and i advertise it as a like a a mini course because the idea is that you come away with a plan for what you can do in your own garden i'm still developing it because i've i've not yet had many visitors um but yes so um once airbnb experiences opens up again um it'll show up um, as the jo- the delight of butterfly gardening is the name of it on Airbnb, um, but yeah, so I- I'm working on a number of th- strategies like that to increase the increase the ability f- for the garden to actually tell its story um, and tell people see what the garden can- what a garden can teach you because mm. um, yeah, but that's that's the delight of it. Um, this is I can't walk past a plant and not to tell you something about what's going on for that particular plant judge based on how the plant's been chewed. Because <laughs> each creature that eats a plant eats it in its own specific way as well, so each species. So you can, you can gauge to some extent what has been there, not for everything because there's so many life forms, but for the life forms I'm familiar with, I can, I can guess at what's what's been eating it if the creature isn't there anymore based on what sort of tracks it's left or whether it's eaten the whole leaf or um but yeah so like it's it's amazingly entertaining and it costs so little money like it just like and you can do it in the smallest of spaces and it's just sort of it's it's there for the taking my suggestion was to some people who, during the uh, lockdowns, the kids were just on um, Facebook or like no, on, on um, devices and they were having trouble getting their kids off their devices. My suggestion was, well, get yourself a little frame and send the kid outside and tell them to put the frame down on the ground and see what they can see there. Mm-hmm. Um, so give them a frame because that seems to be important. Um, it's, it's just... As soon as you start digging, there's so much to life, and we're so so sadly disconnected from it. Or well, so many people are. I'm, I'm probably I'm somewhat disconnected because I'm living in suburbia. But um, yeah. Anyway, so I'm I'm really trying to help people understand the magnificence and joy and delight of well being alive to the world around us. Mm. Because there's so many transferable skills from becoming observant about nature. Um, I have it. Yeah, you, you just you just notice so much more. It's very hard to be bored when you start actually being actively engaged with nature. I agree. So, I agree. It's, it's very it's hard to very be bored little with something. It's always something to look at. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. If it's really bad, you look at a wall and try and see what's climbing up the wall, you know. Yeah. There's always something on your wall. Yeah, that's true. But there's way, but I had a, way less. Yeah. I had sorry, a there's just way less in Sorry. You go. I had a moth lay eggs on my wall uh recently. Uh, just like it was, yeah. and I took a video of it laying eggs and watching that abdomen move and lay those eggs was just amazing. It was so amazing. And then I was lucky mm-hmm. enough to notice when the caterpillars hatched, they were so tiny, so, so small. And they just yeah. all had a little string and went down that. And I don't know what happened to them after that, but it was such a great thing. Uh, like every time you walk outside or even inside your house, like I had a jump spider jump on my head the other day in bed. And that's still exciting. I got to interact with it, you know, take it outside or just have a look what it was, you know, take a photo of it. <laughs> so the world is our oyster when it comes to the amount of creatures we can find. And I think now with these apps like iNaturalist and Quest a Game and 
You know, so many people are becoming yeah. so even competitive in what they find, which is almost what we need. We need to have that, that real big flood of interest in the natural world. So I think what you're doing is just like the most precious of gifts to the world, you know, to all these people that are going to experience incredible joy through having that experience in their own backyards. And as you say, it could be a balcony. It could be a balcony that you have this experience in. So I love that so much. Would you like to tell us a little bit more perhaps about your, own, your next book, just like to say anything you would wish to say so we can promote it well and so people are, you know, excited about reading it? Yep. Um, yeah, but just as a departing point on your last thing, macro photography has had a lot to answer for and I'm very grateful that it's become so much easier to do because I started with 400 ASA slide film with... Um, massive lenses and all of that slide film is basically useless now. A uh, collection of 10,000 odd slides, that's no help at all. But macro photography is amazing because now anybody can do it, which is really helping with this. Um, in relation to the new book, um, it's, I, I think I mentioned earlier, it's, it is about how to integrate biodiversity into our gardens and to start thinking about gardening ecologically so that more and more gardening advice that I see is about growing your plants in raised beds, putting straw, like high intensity, um, not diverse plantings that require high maintenance um, and also that you um, that are going to attract insects that can eat them because they are isolated from the local environment. So my co-author is um, Dick Copeman and our conversation started, I think, back in 2015. We were uh, on an excursion um, on the Darling Downs uh, near some beautiful habitat and the person uh, had, had some lovely habitat but it was mostly country that had been heavily modified so they were revegetating it but he had a row of kale growing and the row of kale were attracting cabbage white butterflies so and the row of kale was in bare earth and and it dawned on me as I was talking with Dick that basically that person had created an island of food in basically a not even a desert, but in almost scorched earth um, in terms of anything else that was happening around it. And and that's how we're taught to garden and that's how we're taught to grow our vegetables. So, like, it's not a, nobody's fault. Um, and it set me to thinking about how do you stop doing that so that how do you stop the creatures that you don't want eating your plants and the natural way to think about it is, well, interplant them and intersperse them with plants that could be generating the predators, parasites and possibly diseases of those, um, of those species that you don't want. And that started us on a conversation that's in fits and starts taken us till late last year to start bedding into um, the book. So the book, um, the book will cover what diversity is about and how it is actually about invertebrates and it's we're writing it in the context of species losses but we've got this amazing opportunity in our own spaces and with our neighbors to do something about that species diversity losses we might not we can't do anything about the complexity of species in natural bushland directly but by getting a community understanding of how important that biodiversity is um, and increasing it in our gardens, we can start thinking about how to um, to bring complexity back um, in other places. So, like, we're not going to be able to easily um, rebuild habitat for fireflies because they've got very complex life cycles um, and complex requirements, by way of example. So that's one that's hard. And that's one where you need to conserve local bushland that's got that habitat in it. But there's so many we can make a difference for. 
and because we're making a difference for them, we're making a difference for all the other animals that are dependent on them in the food web. So um, another underpinning thing in the book is a piece of um, information that I got from a book by Douglas Tullamy called Bringing Nature Home. And his book is about ecological gardening ecologically, but not necessarily food gardening ecologically. And he did a piece of research that showed for, um, for Pennsylvania that um, native plants, and I, and I don't know his methodology, but native plants in his areas, native woody plants supported 35 times more Lepidoptera biomass. So the, roughly the weight of caterpillar and moss larvae than non-native in, invasive species did. And he did that based on, he was, he's an ecologist. So he's sort of, I'm just catching up with him a bit, hopefully. Um, he wasn't aware, he, he, you kind of know, you've been told all along that native plants support these species and you've got a few species that some non-natives will support, but there's not many. But it's, so 35 times more Lepidoptera biomass than the non-natives is 3,500% more food for birds. So the other core bit of information that this book, I, I'm not sure that we've actually written it in here, but uh, an underpinning thing for the book is that it's thought that all Australian terrestrial birds feed their, insect, feed their nestlings insects, irrespective of what they eat as adults. So by growing ornamental plants in our gardens, we're actually reducing the species diversity of birds in urban areas. And so that's, that's a connection to bird people and a good reason for bird people to grow more than nectar producing native plants because nearly all the advice for birds is grow nectar plants. Mm. Some of it is grow plants for fruit eating birds. But if, if all terrestrial birds are feeding the nestlings insects, then you also need to feed larval, to be feeding insect host plants, have host insect host plants. So that's a bit of the complexity. Actually, I need to put that in the book. I haven't actually put that in yet. Um, so this first book, this first edition is a consultation edition. Um, so we're, we'll be uh, offering it to a few hundred people to get feedback from them um, about um, yeah, how the book is. So it's a process, a, a community development process for developing a book um, rather than saying I've got all the answers and this is what you need to know. There's a certain amount of this is what I've found is useful information um, and please tell us does it cover your needs and is there other stuff that you would like to know mm -hmm. um, in right. this context. So, so it's covering like the ecological simplification that we just seem hell-bent on doing but don't need to. Um, it covers a bit of um, how, how, what is biodiversity and how does it work and, and a little bit of very basic biology but people that know that stuff can skip those sections. We put a bit of work into food webs and the relationships with, between plants and insects and what plants do and what insects do. Um, there's a section on um, coming face to face with nature in your garden. So all the different types of sort of a selection of creatures that you will encounter in a garden if you've got a diverse um, diverse species. It's it's whatever interested me at the time <laughs> that I took photos of, or other people that have contributed photos to it. So and so it, it looks a bit about. Um, the complexity that starts arising in gardens. Um, and then it's got a whole section on basically ecological gardening strategies, all the different things to do, like leave falling leaves and logs where they are or move them slightly to the side. Um, put in, if you want to provide water, put in soaks and sort of ponds, but, you know, try to mimic, the, the concept of it is try to mimic what would happen in nature as much as possible and we're not saying it, but throw away the leaf blower because that's ecological simplification in its extreme. Um, but that's just between you and I and whoever's listening to this. Um, and I'll, there's a section on food plants we can share. 
So there's a bit of a section on um, uh, bush food plants that are also host plants. Um, so because the book sort of started its life as a book that was intended to be about food plants we can share, but as I became, as I started seeing the complexity on the ground and understanding what all that e abstract ecological stuff was that I'd learnt, um, uh, it's the complexity that interests me more deeply now. Um, so we're, we're covering a, a, a range of, a selection of plants and what some of the things are that you might observe about them and you can eat some part of them or all of them. Um, and um, oh, and then we've got, we've got a little tiny section on some possible ecological um, competitor management strategies. So throughout the book we're trying to change the language about goodies and baddies into competitors and allies so that we start promoting ecological thinking because really they are just our competitors. They're not baddies. It's just only if we're looking at it from a completely human-centred point of view, which is a challenge if we're going to actually keep a healthy planet, we need to challenge that view. So we're talking about competitors and allies and um, so um, some ecological strategies for some things that might start causing you problems. and. But a lot of that is our speculation, and we name it as speculation because people have to just start trying it and see what happens. Um, and then we've got a little section on bush food um, recipes and some appendices so, um, that give you more detailed, like lists of things. So we've kept the lists out of the out of the text itself, and there's there's lists of other host plants and environmental roles that they can play and. Um, strategies for finding out which plants to you can you find for your area based on ecologic your your original ecosystem mm -hmm. so that's sort of the main sections in it at this stage but and then we'll hope hopefully we've we've tried the concept on two occasions now we ran a workshop um through northey street um last year and more recently we spoke to the um uh, Australian Institute of Landscape Architects about diversifying their plantings. Um, so yeah, so I've got a few more weeks of um, doing layout, which is incredibly labour intensive, and I've kind of forgotten just how labour intensive because I haven't done, I haven't laid out a book in 13 years. So, um, so yeah, it's three, maybe four weeks off um, if things keep going well in terms of layout, um, and. Um, yeah, and so then it'll be out and we'll be offering it to people that particularly want to give us feedback so that within another six months or so we can put out uh, like a first edition. Mm. Um, mm. And that will be available through my website. If I can name it, it's www.earthling.com.au. Um, <coughs> um, and that's it. So, um, yeah, so I guess I don't know what else to say about it other than really trying to emphasise how important it is to start looking past what we can see easily and what we react to um, and start asking deeper questions about what's actually going on here. And it, I mean, that has all sorts of transferable. As soon as you start asking those questions, you start thinking systemically, systematically. So it's actually a book about systems thinking, but it's in the guise of a book about integrating native plants into gardens. <clears throat> yeah. That's great, Helen. Um, that's such a... Yeah, sorry, I'm just... Um, the core problem, can I just... <clears throat> the core problem is that we're completely trained to think in cause and effect and this is one of the underpinning problems in in almost all discussions I hear. And so the underpinning part of the book is to start trying to help people, encourage people to think about relationships and systems mm. and how things are how things are connected in and through each other rather than I've got this problem and therefore that thing there is to blame for the problem. Yeah. Um, but you know that our education system's predicated on cause and effect. So, 
Uh, and I, I would argue that the, we never look for causes. We just want to fix the effects. You know, we don't look at why. Why is that plant being eaten? Is it signaling to be eaten because there's something happening? You know, there are so many complexities of signaling that are happening underground even or just in our own bodies. I oh, mean, yeah. We never ask why. We go to the doctors and want to get a pill. Just fix me. I don't want to know why. Just fix me. But as to like why are we not looking at the causes, you know, and I think this is partly why we're facing this dilemma right now with huge climate change and all kinds of things happening that are just out of we just created an out of balance ecosystem you know and and in your in and you're one of those into you know, integrative steps into how to get back the ecosystem and allow it to be an ecosystem you know that is diverse and healthy and i love that very much yeah i just uh, and, and it, go on. yeah no it's I, something that anybody can do yeah exactly it's it's, it's completely can do. accessible yeah yeah mm. exactly that's the beauty of it we all have the power to do something and we all have the yeah. uh, and there's so many people out there to help us because they know and they've done it for like you know so many years like you have so i just think it's a wonderful opportunity and i hope it gets out into schools as well these concepts of teaching children uh, in the curriculum how to do these things so they can learn how to not even grow food but actually grow food for other organisms as well become more responsible as human beings and I think there's potential for this right now you know this is the time to to be doing this and getting it yeah. out there so th thank you so much Helen I so appreciate your time and all the effort you've put into wood fortius plantings as well and would love to see your garden one day waiting for the book very much so uh, I think we'll end it there but I am looking forward to if you still wanted to do a little presentation we can definitely do that we can add it on otherwise yeah lovely to have you here and to speak to you you know at length uh about this mm. uh, so yeah thanks so much for being here helen and doing this with us you're welcome and thank you to anybody that's um listening and yes hopefully i hope i've infected a few more people <laughs> thanks for listening and we'll speak to you very soon again okay cheers for now bye